Hello and welcome to another episode of the Family Renewal Podcast. I'm Israel Wayne, and today we are blessed to have Tricia Goyer, who is an award-winning, best-selling author of over 70 books, and I can't think of anybody that is more qualified to uh, talk on the issue of writing and publishing than Tricia Goyer, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> we will schedule that for another podcast in the future, and she actually has uh, some great options for you if you want to learn how to be a published author. Um, Tricia, remind me, because we want to talk about that at the end of the podcast and give people an opportunity to plug into your mentoring. Um, yeah, absolutely. But uh, but in this particular uh, episode, we're going to talk about one of the many books that Tricia has written, and we'll get to that shortly. But first of all, uh, Tricia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great being here, Israel. No, thank you. So um, tell us a little bit about your family. You're a mom, and you have a whole bunch of children, and I can <laughs> I can say that because I have eleven children, and so um, you know it's one of those things that most people when I tell them how many children I have, they, they gasp in horror. Um, <laughs> but, but you're one of those moms that mm -hmm. kind of gets that big family dynamic. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, about your family? Absolutely. So I've been married to John for 31 years. Um, and actually, I was a teen mom. And it was during my pregnancy that I dedicated my life to God. I realized I was going the wrong way, prayed for God to do something with my life and give me a future husband that would love me and love God and love my son. And he brought John into my life. So we've been married 31 years. Corey is my oldest son. He's married with four kids. He's 32. Um, then we have a daughter who's a missionary in the Czech Republic. She's 28. We have a 27 year old college student. And then we adopted seven kids. <laughs> so our kids that we adopted are between the ages of 21 and 10. So we just decided to do every stage of parenting all at the same time, kind of similar to you. We just have all the ages, although our youngest is 10, so we don't have the babies and toddlers anymore, but I've been homeschooling since Corey was five, um, and I'm still homeschooling. My youngest is in fourth grade, and so we've been doing this a lot of years, but God has done amazing things, and when I said, please do something with my life, he's like, okay, let me just show you what I can do with your life. You know that statement where you say, and then we adopted seven children? To me... <laughs> What came to my mind is sort of when the Bible, you know, the, one of the greatest understatements of all time and the Bible yeah. says, and God made the stars also. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the, it's one of those things that that's not something that is just uh, an everyday mm -hmm. run of the mill decision. Uh, that's something that you don't get to that decision lightly. And that kind of segues into the book that I want to talk about with you about. We have uh, some of our listeners who are listening on audio, some who are watching on our YouTube channel. And so for those that are on the YouTube channel, I was wondering if you could show them a copy of your book, yeah. Walk It Out. And there the is. Uh, subtitle is The Radical Result of Living God's Word One Step at a Time. And this particular book caught my attention because I think we have a bit of a struggle right now within evangelicalism where you have, I don't want to say two separate factions, but it kind of feels mm -hmm. like it's separating itself out that way, where there's a group of people who are very theological and doctrinal and didactic, and to them, uh, theological precision is very important, and what we believe is important. Yeah. And then there's another group that is a little more focused on the practical application of faith, whether it's social justice, or whether it is getting involved in missions, or whether it's involved getting involved in you know helping the poor, the the homeless, um, adoption, you mm -hmm. know uh, the the, uh, the pr uh, pregnancy issue, helping um, you know working on, on not just being anti-abortion, but finding ways that they can help contribute in in the pro-life. And I know you're somebody who believes that both are important, and exactly. that we don't have to have you know they're not enemies of each other. And, and what I like about the title of your book, Walk It Out, is that it, it describes that kind of what James talks about, that if you truly do have a, a genuine faith, then it will find a practical expression. It will find application. And so your book really challenges people to not stop with biblical orthodoxy, 
to not just be content to have a lot of head knowledge, know a lot of the right things, but to go somewhere with it. And so mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about, and our listeners a little bit about what led you to the story behind the book, not just what led you to the book, because the book is, I, this is what I've gathered from, from how you write your, your nonfiction, at least, is it's like you live something and then yeah. you write about it. <laughs> and so Absolutely. I'm kind of like yeah. that too. Uh, I, I you know, find it very easy in some ways to write the things that I do because I've worked this out for a long, long time before mm -hmm. I ever put, you know, I guess we don't put pen to paper anymore, but you get the point. Uh, but at any rate, so, so this worked itself out in you before it ever found its way onto a, a book project. But what was it in your life that was going on that started to teach you this walk it out principle? And what did that look like practically for you and, and the life of your family? Absolutely. So, I mean, I mentioned I was a teen mom. I had grown up going to church, but my mom became a Christian when I was probably eight or nine years old. So she was a very new believer. We had not had a church background. And so really in my growing up years, it, it was kind of like, uh, I, it wasn't a study foundation. It was something you kind of knew, but it was after I became a Christian as a pregnant teen that I started reading God's word. And um, I took some Bible classes through our church and I was just blown away just how how much um, just love God had for hurting and broken people because I was one of them. I was, you know, pregnant teenager, lots of pain in my teen years and just um, saw me kind of in the gospel message of God bring, bringing healing to my life. And then as I started spending time, I would set the alarm, get up early, get that time in the Bible before I even had time, you know, homeschooling or getting busy with the day, because it just changed me so much as I read it, as I learned more about God, I found myself being changed. And I remember clearly, and this is one of the things I talk about in the book, um, what, our pastor came up and asked me to help start a crisis pregnancy center. And at the time I was home homeschooling and I had also just started writing and started getting things published and I thought I don't have the time for this but you know what do you tell your pastor I'll pray about it <laughs> is the politically correct thing to do to tell your pastor and as I was praying the next morning it became so clear that God's like, what about you? Remember who you were as a teen mom. And as I look about Jesus's compassion to those, you know, the women at the well, I mean, so many people who were hurting and broken and, you know, Zacchaeus, I mean, he was, he went around people that are considered sinners and just loved on them. And I thought, you know, looking at God's word, looking to see how it transformed me. And then, you know, the pastor knew my story and I felt God saying, remember who you were. Wouldn't you have loved someone to just come embrace you in your brokenness? And it, that became the first really big walk it out. I was in my twenties, had kids at home, uh, writing, and then I knew nothing and suddenly was the director of a pregnancy center. But God, our very first training, God brought 31 people there to be trained to run the center and it's still up run, up and running in montana where we used to live um, world magazine uh, probably like five years ago voted it like one of the top 10 ministries in the united states because they take um ultrasound machines and they do they go on to the um native american reservations and it was just like god was saying when i say walk it out like you you can see in my word what I'm asking you to do. And I just need you to take the first steps. And I think so many times we think we have to do everything from that point on. And God's like, I have all these people set up. I have all these things. And that was like the first clear thing, like, oh, when we actually like do what God is telling us to do. Um, and later, you know, like you were saying in James, it says pure religion is this caring for the orphans and the widows. It's like my grandma lives with me. She's 91. She's lived with us for 20 years. And we're like, well, okay, God says to care for the orphans or the widows. We have a widow. So, you know, who is an orphan? And we adopted first from a um, a private adoption, and then six from foster care. And I think it really is not just reading God's word and like, oh, that's a warm, fuzzy thought for the day. But it is like, what is God asking us to do? He's actually giving us directives. He doesn't say, if you have enough money, if you have enough time, do these things. And when he feels that stirring in, puts that stirring in my heart, it was just like, okay, we're just going to have to do what he says. Not that it's easy, but it is the right thing to do. Wow. So, you know, I hear some parents who are in their mind thinking, look, we're maxed out. Mm -hmm. uh, we are barely making it as it is. We're just dog paddling. We're barely keeping our head above water with just life. Um, 
and and then it sounds like what you're saying is that we need to have a perspective of of thinking outside of just you know our current capacity and say you know what else can we do um, my pastor ha- and i hope to have him on a podcast at some point in the future but uh, one of the one of the pastors at my church has a, a ministry that he started called love one more mm. and it's a very simple concept but it's just simply you look at what god's put in your life and you say okay we feel like we're at full capacity but how can we love one more mm-hmm. and that god always allows our hearts uh, and our uh, capacity to expand to meet that that uh, need, you know, when when it's something that God's directing us to do, and so tell me on this uh, adoption thing. I mean, I'm pretty sure that you probably felt maxed out when you <laughs> yes. made that decision, right? It wasn't like you were saying, uh, you know, either a, I just have nothing to do and I'm totally bored, and this seems like something that would <laughs> fill up some time, uh, or b, you know, I have an emotional need inside of myself. Uh, for, you know that I'm hoping that these children will fill. I'm guessing it. Mm. I'm guessing it wasn't either <laughs> either of those. Um, it was it was that your theology was driving you to this. Uh, what what did that look like when you stepped into that? It must have been really scary. Yeah, I, I think. Um, well, first of all, I want I do want to say I don't feel like God is calling every single family to go and adopt seven kids. I mean, we've had people. And it, it really is loving one more might be making a meal for a family. Yeah, that's right. We've no, had very, people. Very true. Yeah like taking our kids overnight so we could have a, a date. I mean, those types yes. of things, it doesn't have to be, but if God calls you, like it was so clear on our hearts, yes. adoption. Yes. And it, I will say adopting, we first adopted a newborn and that was pretty easy. Like, you know, we, we raised, we had three kids. Our youngest was 15 when we adopted her. So we knew how to do the parent thing. Um, so the newborn was pretty easy. Adopting from foster care was a completely different thing. We first got a two-year-old and a five-year-old that had a failed adoption before us that had been through trauma that were acting out. And I didn't know how to raise those kids. It Mm -hmm. was fits on the floor and screaming and kicking and words that I never expected to come out of a little toddler's mouth. And uh, we, I, I, what I realized is that if God is going to ask you to do it, he's also going to help provide. So we mm-hmm. had the most amazing trauma counselors. We have occupational therapists and speech therapists. Like he gave us a community and I really had to humble myself. And I think as a homeschooling mom, as a writer, I helped start a crisis pregnancy center. I can almost get pride and look at all I can accomplish. And suddenly we have two-year-old and five-year-old that one's dumping out the cereal when the other is throwing things and they're completely out of control and cursing. And I'm like, I don't even know where to go with this. I mean, all pride I had in anything I could accomplish was completely out the door. And I had to pull these people around me to help me and support me and teach me. I remember going into trauma therapy the first time with our five-year-old who would just have these horrible fits and try to hurt herself and hurt others. And the therapist was like, she just graduated. She must have been 24, 25. Her name is Brittany. I'm like, Brittany, tell me what to do with this child. And so much of what I've learned has been through therapists that know how to deal and help kids in trauma. I was completely out of my zone ill-prepared, um, overwhelmed. And as someone who was capable, that was really, really hard. But it really, again, brought me to my knees where I needed God. I needed to depend on him. I needed other people. And even now, as we're doing this interview, we have an occupational therapist and a speech therapist in the other room working with my kids, even during the summer. And so it's just humbling myself over and over again. And then I thought, okay, we're done. Like we had three little kids at the time. We had two that were married and that one that was in college. And I'm like, we're done. And God had us open our hearts to teenage girls because so many girls age out of foster care. When I mentored teen moms that age out of foster care, they were pregnant. They're living from house to house. And, and I remember telling John one night, like someone needs to get these girls before they end up there. And God was just so clearly like both of our hearts during one church service, we both came out, came out crying, knowing that God was calling us to adopt a sibling group of teenage girls and I'm telling you, it was, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done because not only are they like throwing tantrums, but they had words that just would pierce my heart because they've been hurt so many times that that's all they know what to do. They're afraid to let people close. And so, I mean, can talk about, you know, I, I mean, overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, the laundry's never caught up. The house isn't clean. If I were to like take you through my house, it's very real house. I'm never able to keep up with all the things, but then I'm sitting with them in church and I see them worshiping God. And mm-hmm. I 
I'm doing Bible study with them in the morning and they're asking questions. During one of our mornings, um, our daughter who was 11 year old, old at the time said, I want to accept Christ. And they're at our homeschool table, accepted Christ. And it's like, it's hard. Yes, but it's right. It's mm. what God has asked us to do. And even we have some that have left the home. One has gone, she turned 18 and went back with her biological mother, which has been heartbreaking. But for six years of her life, she was sitting around my table hearing about God's word, hearing the YWAM missionary stories, having us pray together. And so I know that even though in the season, of course, I want her to, you know, I, I can't see her. She's with her biological mom, but she has had that foundation that she wouldn't have gotten if she would have stayed just moving from foster home to foster home. So although it's been hard, um, I just know that God has a plan, even if I can't see it like perfect, it's not going to be perfectly laid out. Um, at this moment, but God has a plan and he called us to it. And I know it's been the right thing to do. A lot of people say in sort of a cliche way that God will never give you more than you can handle. <laughs> and, and they base that on that passage in James where it says that we'll never be tested mm -hmm. beyond our capacity to resist the temptation. Um, and so they take that and sort of apply it to the issue of, well, God will never give us more than what we can handle. I haven't found that to be true in life. Mm -hmm. um, I have found that typically God gives us way more than what we can actually handle because then we realize that this all surpassing power is not of us. Yeah. <laughs> We're yeah. just these vessels of clay and it, the power is ultimately from God and it causes us to lean on him in a way that we didn't know we needed to before. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think you, you mentioned this whole thing about I'm trying to keep up appearances. And I, I talked with a dear friend yesterday about this. And he said, I think one of the things that I see within the Christian homeschooling community, which is part of, you know, I, I work in that arena, that uh, mm -hmm. community a lot. And I'm not just picking on them. I think it, it really it could be all, all church people, but you know, I, I know it to be true of, of the community I work the closest with. Yeah. He, he said, I, I see within that community that there are a lot of families that just work so hard at keeping up appearances and looking good and everything is falling apart in their life. And he said, I just wonder why that is, you know, mm -hmm. why is it that it's like they'll, they'll even allow everything to kind of completely fall apart in their life uh, in order to just sort of save face. And what I hear you saying is sometimes the house isn't immaculate and sometimes not sometimes it's never immaculate. Yeah. And, and you know and, and, and in our home you know sometimes our children aren't on grade mm -hmm. point and mm -hmm. you know there's things that fall through the cracks what, what do you recommend to people who find themselves in that place where they feel discouraged because they feel like they're not measuring up and yet they want to reach out they want to do more but they feel like we're not you know we're not where we need to be I heard you mention about turning the Lord and, and community. Yeah. Uh, unpack that a little bit. Yeah. And I think really it came down to like, you're talking about like putting on the front, like I have my act together. I mean, when I only had three kids that I was homeschooling, the house was pretty clean. Like we can, I could keep up with everything that was going yeah. on, even though I had book deadlines. And then I remember one day just like piles of laundry and like the kids are running around and fighting with each other and just like weeping in the the laundry room like my laundry room cry session and I felt God like not an audible voice but speaking to my heart like I love you just as much if the kids are fighting and the laundry is not cut up and I think even with God like we feel like we have to like do all the right things put on the all the right appearances and I'm gonna homeschool and do the pick the right curriculum I mean we're, it's like all that is our way of proving our worthiness and God was just saying, like, it doesn't matter. Like, you're doing what I asked you to do. And I really don't care about the laundry. Like, it wasn't audible at all. Yeah. But I felt that peace yeah. in my heart. It. And it, it really was. And it really has been now. Like, what is more important? Because um, I have piles of laundry to fold in my living room right now. I have piles of books that I need to finish going through for homeschool. Like, and God's saying, but you have kids in your home. And, you know, that's what's important. It's not always having the clean house. And for me, it was kind of like putting down that pride. And even when the, the therapist first started coming over, I'd like try to have the clean house clean before the therapist came over. And pretty soon I'm like, I'm so tired. I cannot keep up. And 
they needed didn't need me to put on appearances either. And I found out when I'm like able to like welcome a neighbor into my home, welcome the therapist in my home, they're stepping over shoes by the front door, they see the real life, then they're like, oh, I can really share my struggles too because I can see you don't have your act together. And we think we need to look good for people to like point them to God. But really, when we're real and vulnerable, that's what people connect with. People can share their stories and their hard things in their life because they see that we're not perfect and we're struggling too. And when we put that false perfection and image out there, people don't feel like they can approach us. And I think, I mean, when I'm at homeschool conferences, I have people coming up and they're sharing about the hurt in their families and the pain of, you know, some that have been caused by some of their kids from trauma. And we're able to cry together and we're able to be real and vulnerable. And I'm able to pray for them, truly understanding where they are. And those conversations would not have happened if I've been like, hey, perfect homeschool mom here. Come and, you know, look at the stuff that I've written. It, it really is um sharing our pain and our hurt and our hardship with other people that bring us into community and that's what true community is it's sharing what you're struggling with asking people to pray for you praying for other people and that's how we can show the love of god because everyone is hurting out there everyone has a struggle no one has it perfect and uh when we're trying to put that facade we're just really just pushing other people away well, that's one of the things I appreciate about you. One of the reasons I wanted you on our podcast is that you have a certain authenticity with you. And I grew up in Christian publishing. My mom mm-hmm. started a Christian publishing house in 1988, and I had a chance to grow up around authors. And, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of, of people in that world that are just disingenuous. They're mm-hmm. not real. Um, they, you know, they, <laughs> this is, I'm getting a little too personal here, but there's, <laughs> even like they, they pay for these amazing glamour shots, mm-hmm. you know, for their book covers and stuff. And you meet them and they don't look anything like that, you know, <laughs> and there's just, uh, I think, a realness and a genuineness about you. You're at the conferences with your children, mm-hmm. you know, you're just they're being running around with... without shoes on. And with, I mean, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, that was my child. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I think that's just one of the things that people respect about you and that I've I've learned about people who follow your work is that they connect with you, not just because you're a great writer, but because uh, you really are uh, a genuine, accessible person. And uh, I think that gives them hope, you know, because um, you're, you're not someone who lives in an ivory tower. And a lady told me the other day, she said, that when I first met you, I was kind of intimidated. And she's <laughs> like, it wore off pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's like then I realized you were just a real person I was like oh okay he's just a real person but I, I think um, I, I think one of the things that I like about your book uh, walk it out too is that while you tell your story and you talk about foster care and you talk about mm-hmm. adoption you talk a little bit about just your experience with the you know working in the, in the pro-life community you're not narrowing it down to this is these are the channels through which God wants you to walk out your faith Um, it's deeper and broader than that and so you know for me as I read it and I was being challenged as to well what does what does that look like for my family and how does God want us to uh, to to walk it out and so um, as as we close here uh, we come to the end of the uh, the podcast Um, what's your preferred way for people to get in touch with you what are some of the best ways for them to buy your book i know a lot of authors like to direct people to amazon i always tell them if you buy it on amazon it certainly is convenient but the authors make like no money on that whatsoever (laughs) so we make like 65 cents or something ridiculous like that per book so it's not like that's a huge help for our families but um is your website the best place for people to contact you and absolutely so trishagoyer.com Um, And I have a shop. So when we stopped doing conferences last year, I mean, you know, we still have to pay the bills. We still have, like, we're not getting speaking fees. And I'm like, I had a garage full of books that I'd bought for all these conferences. And so I put up an online shop that has all of my books on there. And yeah, I do make much more money on my online shop. But, you know, I mean, if you're, if that only, Amazon's the only place you could get it, then get it there. But yeah, I do have my online shop. I autograph them and my 10 year old, is my shipping manager. Awesome. She puts the orders together and packages them. But yeah, just trishagoyer.com. And um, you could also on, on Facebook, I'm always there and answering messages and connecting with people. That's another great way that I just like to connect. And 
I get, I do get a lot of private messages with people that are hurting because of, you know, after adoption or struggles that they have. And I'm always open to connecting with people either through my website or through Facebook, um, just to give encouragement. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know how to spell Trisha's name, it's with a C, so T-R-I-C-I-A-G-O-Y-E-R.com. She's also available on uh, Facebook, um, has some great posts on there, a great way to um, just follow her and kind of see what's going on in her life. Again, uh, she'll sign the books if you order them from her website. I do that on our website too, because that's something Amazon won't do. So right. uh, that's that's a blessing for you know you supporting our families by purchasing our books. You know we want to be able to bless you as well. Um, but then tell us also about your podcast because you have a phenomenal podcast. It's amazing, and the guests yeah. you have on there are, are top shelf. It's it's oh, incredible. I love it. It's called Walk It Out, which is kind of based on the book. And it really, it's just walkitoutpodcast.com. And I do, I like to interview people just sharing about how they are walking out, what God is asking them to do. And it's super fun. I get to talk to people that I never would have thought. It, mm -hmm. You know, that's just the fun thing about it. Um, and then you also said to mention my writing. Um, so on my website, if you look at Write That Book, I also have a private subs subscription group where I mentor people who want to become writers. We have a community and I have editors and agents and other professional writers. We do live videos every single week and answer questions. And so again, like I could write so many books, Israel, you can only write so many books, but if we could train people to get the good news out there and share it even more, that's what I love doing. Cause the more we can just spread the gospel in whatever manner God is asking us to do, then the better. Well, I've had a chance to watch some of Trisha's mentoring videos on writing and uh, she's one of the best in the industry. I mean, she probably wouldn't tell you that. She's going to be humble <laughs> and say, oh, no, I'm not. She is. And, uh, you know, there are those of us who write and that would be people like me. And then there are writers uh, like Trisha. And but she's also just has the experience and has worked with so many different publishing houses, has had, had so many experiences of uh, success and rejection and every kind of experience you could possibly have within Christian publishing. And so um, you're going to get a wealth of information. So, you know, when I meet people and they know that I'm a traditionally published author, they're often like, OK, how do I break in? I have a book mm -hmm. inside of me. I want to tell my story or I want to write a novel or whatever. And uh, Trisha has also written novels she, of, of various genres, but she's written a lot of nonfiction as well. So she knows both sides of that coin. Um, and, and I find that it's it's difficult to break in to that industry if you don't have mentorship from somebody who's been yeah. there and kind of knows where the landmines are. And so again, go to her website, trishagoyer.com and get plugged into her mentoring. If you really want to learn how to be a Christian author or writer, she's going to give you a lot of great tips about uh, the writing process and about the publishing process. And uh, we will, if she's willing, have her back on because oh, yeah. <laughs> she has a number of books that are relevant for our audience on the, uh, the parenting front. I'm just going to show you a couple of them just really quickly. Uh, the Grumble Free Year. Um, if you want to learn how to uh, get rid of the complaining and uh, grumbling that happens in your family, this is a good resource. And then uh, this one, Call Me Angry Kids, um, Help and Hope for Parents in the Whirlwind. Uh, those are some some great ones. Uh, here's one more. Uh, Blue Like Play-Doh, The Shape of Motherhood and the Grip of God. These are books that I want to have. And, and then also uh, this one, um, Prayers That Changed History. So this is a great book also. Uh, for those, especially of the, those of you who are homeschooling, you can incorporate that as part of your uh, a supplement to your history curriculum. And so, so many great other, other books that we could talk about. Um, and so I definitely want to have her back on uh, the podcast in the future to talk about some of those titles. And uh, in the meantime, uh, Tricia, also, what if there's a conference or a seminar, you know, like a, a women's conference or a homeschooling conference or someplace that's an event that wants to have you come and speak. What's that process look like? How can they get in touch with you? Oh, that's wonderful. So on my website, I have a speaking page and they can, there's a, like a form for them to fill out, like when's the date and when's the, you know, what, if it's homeschooling or writing women's conference and they can just put the information and then my wonderful assistant, Kristen goes through these and we have dates open, then we'll, love to talk to you and see if it'll work. Cause I do, I love like you Israel, 
getting face to face and connecting with people at conferences. So yeah, on my website is the speak, speaking page and you could just put your inquiries there. Excellent. And again, you know, if you're in the mood for uh, jumping into some new fiction, you want to read some novels and kind of give your, your brain a rest and be able to just <laughs> jump into something that's fun and that's uh, enjoyable, but still from a Christian perspective. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the books that Trisha writes, they have a historical uh, background, so you can actually learn a bit about history, especially yep. some of the ones that are uh, built around the, the different wars and so forth. And, and again, you have some wonderful stories uh, of your own life and connections to some of those novels. Mm -hmm. um, but so it, it can be a great way for you to have uh, a chance to uh, just get away from the stress of, of the, the demands of life for a little bit, enjoy a book, but also be getting historical and spiritual benefit from it at the same time. Uh, that's Absolutely. a win all the way around. And so again, Trisha Goyer, so thankful to have you on the podcast. Look forward to next time. Thank you for having me. All right. God bless.